Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. It's the cultural turmoil in our society caused by identity politics due to rejecting the Old Testament, specifically Genesis. Have some in the church rejected the very foundation of our biblical worldview? Our guest today is Ken Ham, the founder of Answers in Genesis, the Ark Encounter, and the Creation Museum. He is here to address these questions and more when we return. Our country is in a dark, challenging, and anomalous place. As Christians, we are not only called to represent the standard for living life before the holy and just God, but also to live countercultural to the forces of darkness. In its third season, Kingdoms in Conflict addresses these issues from a biblically conservative worldview. Text Kingdoms to 877-425-2104 for free access to our media and resources. Together, Let's take back America for the kingdom of God. Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. We're privileged to have with us today, Mr. Ken Ham. How you doing, sir? Hey, I'm doing well. It's great to be with you. And uh, by the way, behind me is the Ark Encounter, which is a life-size Noah's Ark here in Northern Kentucky. And you probably see people walking around. So uh, it's a live view. Yeah, it's, that's an incredible view. I've, I've actually been there. I'm going to ask you a question about that in, a, in, in just a minute. But before we go there, normally I ask, not everyone who comes on the program is actually a Christian. But when I do have Christians on, I ask them to give a little bit of their testimony. I'm sure you could talk for the whole time about how you came to Christ and a call to ministry. But give, give uh, our audience just a little snippet of how you came to Christ and how you got in this particular ministry. Well, you know, I grew up in Australia. I hope I still have that Aussie accent. Uh, but I grew up in Australia and had Christian parents uh, who taught us God's word, the Bible. And they also taught us answers to the skeptical questions people had that uh, they used to say, oh, you can't trust the Bible. So they taught us to defend uh, our Christian faith. And I, at age 10, uh, was in a program that my parents had organized. They used to bring missionaries in to be able to reach children with the truth of God's word and the gospel. And in one of those missionary programs, the missionary had a challenge for those of us who wanted to do whatever God wanted us to do and go wherever he wanted us to go. And it was at that time I realized, yes, what my parents have taught me and taught me about the Bible and, and about the message of, of sin and repentance and salvation. Yes, that, that that's what I believe and have trusted Christ and I want to do whatever he wants me to do and go wherever he wants me to go. I didn't know at that stage it would mean coming to America and being involved in building a creation museum and a, a life-size ark but at age 10 that's when I really made that uh, commitment and when I went to high school and was taught evolution I realized there was a conflict between evolution and the bible and I remember talking to my parents and they said, if, if you don't believe Genesis, how can you believe the rest of the Bible? Because the whole of the rest of the Bible is founded in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. And so we started to search answers in regard to that issue as well and found all sorts of scientific and biblical answers. And so that had a great impact on my life. So really it was because of parents who taught us God's word and the truth of God's word. Well, that's great to have uh, godly parents that could instill that within you. So, so that helps us you know, try and understand how you started the ministry uh, answers in Genesis? Yes. Um, actually, the start of it sort of goes back, if you like, to uh, 1975. And even before that, you know, when I went to high school and was taught evolution, we saw that conflict between evolution and the Bible, then went to university and, you know, was taught evolution as fact. And so I did a lot of research to try to find answers to what they were saying about so-called ape men and millions of years and so on. When I became a science teacher in Australia in 1975, the first science lesson I taught, the students said, so we heard you're a Christian because I agreed to head up the Christian group in the school. And I said, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, how can you be a Christian? We know the Bible is not true. How do you know it's not true? Well, because of what our textbooks teach us about evolution and ape, ape men and millions of years and so on. And so I realized then that this was a real stumbling block to them. So I started to teach them answers from science and the Bible, even in the public school, you could do that back then. And I remember one day I was teaching about the Tower of Babel and there were three Australian Aboriginal kids 
uh, in my class and they come up to me afterwards and said, sir, tell us more. Because then I realized, of course, Darwin taught the Australian Aboriginals were the missing links in evolutionary history right. and closest to the apes. And here I was telling them we're all one family. We all go back to Noah, back to Adam, and we're all related. And they uh, were really interested in that. And, you know, that's when I really got interested in talking about that whole issue of so-called uh, races and so on and dealing with the fact we're all one race and so I started to teach them uh, these things and took them to museums and they were, they were from an evolutionist perspective and the Lord gave me a burden why can't we have a creation museum and then I started teaching in churches I was asked to come and speak in some churches and found most Christians thought well do we need to believe Genesis does it matter can't you believe in evolution and so it was back then that the Lord really burdened me to start a ministry. It actually started in our home in 1977 in Australia. And uh, we moved to America in 1987 uh, to work over here and uh, moved to Northern Kentucky in 1994, specifically to build that creation museum, which we prayed for in 1980. I stood on a piece of property with one of our board members in Australia and prayed for a creation museum in 1980. And that was opened in the state of Kentucky uh, in uh, 2000 and uh, 16, so we, we uh, not 2016, that's when the ark was open, 2007 uh, was when the creation museum was open. And, you know, God's ways are not our ways. I understand mm -hmm. that, but uh, it's been an interesting journey all the way along. So let's talk about the creation museum. I actually had that, that question a little further down in my notes, but since you brought it up, what was the impetus behind the creation museum itself? Well, you know, the first series of exhibits were what we call a, a walk through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, um, what we call the seven seas of history. Because one of the things that I had found was that for a lot of Christians and a lot of young people in our churches, they're all confused. We've got all these, these issues. We've got the Bible here and then creation and then evolution. And, and then we've got to deal with all these other issues, you know, abortion and marriage and, and racism and so and, and people are all confused. Well, how, how do you deal with all of that? And one of the things that I recognized was that most people were missing that linear view of history, you know, and even how, how, do, you, how do you understand fossils and all those sorts of things. Right. And if you start with the Bible's history that God has revealed to us in Genesis 1 to 11, it's the biological, geological, astronomical, anthropological history that's the foundation for our worldview in every area. So once you start there, and you understand, okay, you walk through the seven seas of history at the museum, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, then Christ's cross consummation. So a perfect creation marred by sin, death is a consequence. That's why there's death in the world. It's not God's fault, it's our fault. We sinned against a holy God, the promise of the savior, uh, catastrophe, the flood of Noah's day. That's why there are fossils all over the world. The Tower of Babel, God gives different languages. That's why there are different people groups, not races, we're all one race, we all go back to Adam, we're all one family, we're Adam's race. And so once you understand that foundational history, it brings everything together. And because every doctrine is founded ultimately in Genesis. I mean, the origin of marriage is in Genesis, the origin of right, sin. Right. So the base of the gospel, the origin of death, the origin of clothes, the origin of everything is right there in Genesis 1 to 11 of all the basic entities of life in the universe. So I wanted people to be able to understand the importance of believing God's word beginning in Genesis. Because if we don't raise up generations that have that right foundation, they won't know what to believe about marriage. And with all that's happening in our culture today, a lot of young people in our churches are in a mess because they're being impacted by the LGBT movement or the abortion movement or whatever it is. Once you understand and believe that history in Genesis, you've got a foundation to have the right worldview in every area and know what you believe and why. That, that, that was really the impetus behind the Creation Museum. And to build an attraction that's world-class, as, uh -huh. as good as, as Disney, or better, and I think I would say <laughs> better quality than Disney, right. okay. and we're not banging them on the head with the Bible, walking them through, giving them answers, presenting the gospel very clearly, uh -huh. and challenging them. And we've seen many, many non-Christians who come and are challenged by uh, this and, and uh, are converted as a result, actually. As you know, there are certain people who are saying we need to divorce the Old Testament from the New right. Testament in order to get people to come to Christ. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. And, you know, I have met people over the years that say, oh, we're New Testament Christians. But here's the thing. The New Testament is all founded in the Old Testament. 
and the entire Bible, everything is founded in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Um, for instance, you know, to give you an example, when people say, oh, you know, you can disconnect the Old Testament from the New Testament, you don't, you don't need the Old Testament. Well, if you're going to go out there and present the gospel to someone and you say, you're a sinner, and they say, well, where did sin come from? Do you realize you have to go back to Genesis 1 to 11? You have to go right. back to, to Genesis 3 to understand where sin came from, when man rebelled, when the devil tempted Adam and Eve. How do you explain the gospel without uh, believing the history right there in Genesis 1 to 11? Or what about marriage? If someone says, what do you believe about marriage? Well, let's look at what Jesus said in the New Testament in Matthew 19. And, and he basically, this is reiterated in Mark 10 as well. But in Matthew 19, mm -hmm. he said, haven't you read which is the authority of the word, by the way. Haven't you read, he who made the beginning made the male and female, which is Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. That's the text of Genesis 1, 27, which is also Jesus affirming two genders, male and female. Haven't you read, he who made the beginning made the male and female. And then the next bit he, Jesus states, is actually the text of Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when God, uh, the Bible explains, took dust and made Adam, put him to sleep, and from his side made a woman. And so then Jesus said, um, have you read, he who made the beginning made the male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they'll be one flesh. So there's Jesus quoting the text of Genesis 2.24. Genesis 2.24 is actually the creation of marriage. That's where God created marriage. And there's only one marriage that God created. It was a male and a female, a right. man and a woman. And you know, you could go through and do that for every doctrine because it, as you start to go through, um, where, where do you find the origin of death uh, in Genesis 1 to 11? Sin, Genesis 1 to 11. Why do you wear clothes? You know, we're all wearing clothes. Humans wear clothes. Why do you wear clothes? The animals don't. God gave clothes because of sin. It was, was actually the first blood sacrifice as a covering for their sin, pointing to the Savior who would come and be the ultimate sacrifice. Why do we have a seven-day week? God made everything in six days and rested for one. Why did Jesus die on the cross well genesis 1 to 11 why is he called the last adam well genesis 1 to 11 why do we need a new heavens and new earth genesis 1 to 11 i mean you go through it and you realize wait a minute genesis 1 to 11 is the key it's the foundation you can't divorce the old testament from the new testament or the new testament Amen. is is founded in the old testament and it's all founded in the first 11 chapters those first 11 chapters are vital my dissert i wrote a dissertation on um how the uh, writer of the Gospel of John used the Old Testament, used the Pentateuch, actually to talk about who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, obviously, you know, you know, the very first verse, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and so forth. Right. And it's clearly referring back to Genesis that that Jesus was there and was part of that creative process. And there are other texts, I mean, other throughout the Gospel of John that that refer back to the uh, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, Deuteronomy, and Genesis, for that matter. So I'm. I'm, I'm right with you. I'm one of your cheerleaders. And I'm thinking that those people who are trying to divorce the, the Old Testament from the new really have bought into the whole idea that somehow, and you talk about this in your movie, uh, you know, Genesis, uh, Paradise Lost, uh, that, you know, they, they bought into the whole thousand, millions of years. Um, and they bought into the whole idea that, you know, evolution, uh, there's even some who try and christianize evolution you know call it theistic evolution right. um what do you say what do you say to that how do, you, how do you deal with those people who are trying to um say that somehow we can christianize <laughs> the, uh evolution well first of all we, we we need to understand that evolution is based in naturalism naturalism is atheism in other words charles darwin try to come up with a way of explaining life without God by natural processes. I mean, if you go to the public schools, their textbooks and what most of the teachers are teaching, they don't teach that God brought life into existence. They're saying it all happened by natural processes. Naturalism is atheism. Many in the church have said, oh, we'll take man's ideas there and we'll just say God used evolution. Um, we, we have people who say, oh, well, you know, we have these secular scientists saying the fossils were laid down over millions of years. We'll just say uh, that uh, we can add that to the Bible and reinterpret the days of creation and so on. And first of all, number one, when you take something outside the Bible, take it to the Bible and reinterpret the Bible, you're undermining the authority of the word of God. But right. think about the inconsistencies here. If you're going to believe in millions of years, the idea of millions of years came out of atheism in the 1800s 
when um, atheists said, we don't believe the Bible, we don't believe in Noah's flood, so the fossils were laid down millions of years before man. Now, if you take that and say all the fossils were laid down millions of years before man, then you've got death before sin. Even in the New Testament, Paul in Romans 5 says, by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. Romans 8 tells us the whole creation groans because of sin. And so when you look in the fossil record, you see all that death, that death had to come after sin. Not only death, but in the fossil record, you see evidence of diseases like cancer in the bones. And I mean, after God created everything, he said everything was very good. If you believe in millions of years, then God said cancer is very good. And you see, we need to understand that death is an enemy. That's what the Bible says. It's an intrusion right. because of sin. And so the fossil record has to come after sin. How do you explain fossils all over the earth in layers thousands of feet thick? Well, the Bible tells us of a global flood. And so uh, most of the fossil record is the graveyard of the flood, not the graveyard of millions of years. You can't add evolution to the Bible. And evolution says man came from some sort of ape-like creature. Well, the Bible says man was made from dust. And woman was made from his side. Woman wasn't made from uh, and, and or didn't come from some ape woman or something like that. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, twice, Paul says, woman came from man. And so the Bible's history is true. Evolution is not true. Amen. Amen. And I think evolution is one of the most racist um, <laughs> uh, ideologies that, that are out there because they say that, you know, we came from monkeys and they want to say, as, as you mentioned, ab, that ab, Aborigines are um, on the lower scale uh, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, white well, yeah, in, in, in Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, that was written 12 years after his yeah. origin of the species, that's the most racist book around. I mean, Darwinian evolution is, is, is really racist. It fuels racism because it teaches certain people, such as the Australian Aborigines and people from Africa are closest to the ape-like creatures. And Darwin taught that the Caucasians were further away and they're superior. That's, that fuels racism. The Bible teaches we all go back to the three sons of Noah. Read Genesis 9 very carefully. And then we go back you know, to Noah and then back to Adam. We're all equal before God. We're all one family. Um, unfortunately, uh, Darwinian evolution has fueled racism. And you know, in 1925, the main biology textbook used in the public schools in America by a man called Hunter actually taught there were five races and taught that the Caucasians were the highest race. That's what students in public schools were taught. I mean, it's evil. And yet Darwin is defended today uh, because if people don't want to believe in God, well, what are they going to believe? They believe in evolution. So, so they, they protect Darwin because he's like the high priest of their religion today. I, had a, I was on radio program the other day and we were talking about race relationships, right? race relations. And I said, race, race relations aren't going to change because some people don't want it to change. They right. want to use white guilt. They want, to, they want to continue to keep that going. I said, the only way, we, only way races, that we'll see some change with race relations is, would be in the church because it's the church where we're supposed to model for everybody else what it means for there to be different ethnicities. I shouldn't even use race because we are one race, the human race. Right. But we're so used to talking about race as if we're different, but we're not because Genesis tells us we're created in the image of God. And well, so, we, you know, yeah, uh, and those differences we have on the outside are minor. It's like even skin color. You know, people divide people into black and white, but there are no black technically and there are no white technically. We're all right. brown. We have a pigment called melanin and you can have a lot of melanin, be very dark a little bit, be very light uh, and anywhere in between. And it's very easy to understand that from genetics. It's just a minor genetic difference. That's all it is. And unfortunately, you know, you've got uh, philosophies like CRT invading the church. Right, um, and right. it's teaching people to judge people according to their outside. You know what the Bible says? It's our inside that matters. You don't judge people according to their outside. It's, it's our inside. It's who we are. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I, I think what's missing from a lot of Christians is this. A lot of them look on the Bible as sort of a book over here and all our thinking's over here. If right. we understand that the Bible is a revelation from God who knows everything, then it's the foundation of our worldview, of our thinking. And Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation of the rest of the Bible. That's the foundation of our worldview. Once we understand that, then we'll have the right way of thinking. Amen. Amen. I do, in our last few minutes, I do want you to talk about your movie, uh, Genesis uh, Paradise Lost. I just watched it the other day and found it fascinating. Uh, what, what is, 
clearly you have more than one part because only I saw the first one and it sounds as though it's a series, right? Do you want to explain how that? Um, um, what, what, what your intention? Well, that was that was part in a sense part one, but it's a it's a movie and there was intention of bringing out a second movie, but it's 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 really going through the book of Genesis and. Uh, we we have some uh, there's some animation uh, in there and mm -hmm. we actually show uh, that uh, at one particular time in our 4D theatre uh, at the Creation Museum we show the section of the animation you can see dinosaurs in in 3D you put on the 3D glasses and they're walking around uh, there because one of the things we want people to understand is if you take God's word as it's written God made all the land animals. Uh, on day six and he also made Adam and Eve on day six and today we call some of those land animals dinosaurs so uh, what we call dinosaurs we're walking around with Adam and Eve we want people to have a true understanding of Genesis and the history God has revealed to us and to decontaminate their thinking because many of them have been contaminated by the world and we got wrong idea about dinosaurs we got the wrong idea about the age of the earth we got we you know a lot of people think that uh the sun uh, came first was well, the bible makes it very clear god made the earth first covered with water the sun wasn't made until day four and right. then they get confused how can you have day and night without the sun well you don't need the sun for day and night you need light and darkness and you've got light and darkness on day one god just doesn't tell us where the light came from he made the sun and the moon to be the light bearers on the earth from day four onwards so we're, we're teaching people to have the right understanding of God's word in Genesis so they understand the world correctly. Well, we're about out of time. So I'm going to encourage everyone to go out and, and buy the movie. I actually rented it. Oh, excuse me. I bought it and I watched it online. I've, I've stopped getting DVDs these days. So, so I didn't I understand. purchase it. I've had a chance to actually watch it twice. And uh, I really appreciate what it is you're doing with the ARC, with the Creation Museum, with all the other things you're doing, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in your corner. I'm an amen person because I understand I have two master's degrees in, in the Hebrew Bible. So I love the Old Testament. Uh, my PhD is in New Testament. So uh, I figured when I was getting my degree, I, if, if, if I'm going to be a well-rounded biblical scholar, I need to actually get my PhD in, in New Testament. So uh, uh, I clearly see Old Testament and New. I tell people, look, you can't understand New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. In fact, the, the apostles went around preaching. Where did they preach from? They preached from the Old Testament. Exactly. They didn't have a New Testament. <laughs> it was being written as they spoke, right? right. So anyway, uh, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for being with us. And those who are watching, we'll be back in just a moment. Thank you. Rooted in the principles of responsible government, individual liberty and fidelity, strong family values, and economic empowerment, Freedom's Journal Institute strives to advance the kingdom of God through socio-political education and engagement rooted in a biblical worldview. We believe that when Christians, regardless of ethnicity, stand for what we believe in, actively engage in the political process, and prioritize biblical truth, then our country will change. Over the years, we have pledged as an organization to challenge liberal ideology with biblical, sound, conservative principles and values to promote a stable and sustainable family and society. Visit us at freedomsjournalinstitute.org or text KINGDOMS to 877-425-2104 to download our app and receive free access to our media and resources, along with regularly updated news, events, and information as it is available. It is time for us to rise. Welcome back. In a different episode of Kingdoms in Conflict with Tim Mahoney, I mentioned the need to understand the Old Testament in my final thoughts. I used information gathered from my dissertation and my book, Jesus on Trial, the unique presentation of Jesus in the Gospel of John. I made mention of the Genesis parallels in that episode. In this episode, I wanna show the importance of the Old Testament regarding the idea of the quote, prophet like Moses and the trial theme that spans the gospel. However, I can only give you a taste of it here. Quote, the Lord, your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, end quote. That's from Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. These are the words of Moses to the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 through 19, God 
speaks, saying, quote, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him, end quote. In the Gospel of John, these are prophetic words about Jesus. Remember, Philip tells Nathanael in John chapter 1, verse 45, quote, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, end quote. And then Jesus himself mentions that the scriptures and Moses write about him. In John 5, 39, quote, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. And again, as Jesus exposes the hypocrisies of the Jewish leadership, saying, quote, If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? End quote. That's in John chapter 5, verses 46 through 47. Deuteronomy is at least one of the places Moses writes about Jesus. In my book, Jesus on Trial, asked, can Jesus be identified as the prophet like Moses? If so, then everything that Jesus says comes from the mouth of God. The identification of Jesus as the prophet coheres with the trial theme in the Gospel of John. The establishing of Jesus as the prophet validates Jesus' testimony because as the prophet sent from God, his words are the very words of God, Deuteronomy 18, 18. This identification, therefore, validates Jesus' claims that if Israel does not receive him, they do not receive the one who sent him. Jesus, as the prophet, stands as God's representative. To reject Jesus and his words is to reject God. As the prophet, Jesus' claims about himself, that he is the Son of God and the Messiah, must be taken seriously. The prophetic office that Jesus holds validates that what he says is what God says. Therefore, if Jesus claims to be the Son of God and the Messiah, his testimony is true. The Father has also claimed or testified that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. Therefore, Jesus' testimony is that of the Father as his own. One cannot understand the significance of the prophet like Moses' expectation of the first century and the use of the theme in the Gospel of John and Luke. Luke 24, 44, Jesus says, quote, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, end quote. So how can we fully understand the advent of Jesus unless we have some confidence in the very scriptures that speak about him? The Old Testament. You can't build a solid theology or worldview without recognizing the Old Testament as the New Testament's foundation. Those who dispose of the old in favor of the new deceive themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Kingdoms in Conflict.